Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to second day of the first international symposium of Earth, Energy, Environmental Science, and Sustainable Development 2020 in School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia. This event covers numerous subjects, ranging from the broad Earth science, energy, and environmental science to more specific topics on sustainable development goals, SDGs, and the special issues of coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, and community engagement for better environment. This symposium delightedly invites all interested national and international experts and enthusiasts from universities, institutions, organizations, businesses, and the communities themselves. Hosted virtually by Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development and School of Environmental Science has the honor to present you this international symposium. This symposium is presented by the committee which has nurtured the virtuous culture of collective values and the vibrant youth spirits of the School of Environmental Science. For a brief moment, we would like to invite you to rise and sing Indonesian anthem, Indonesia Raya. May all we rise. now. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will continue to the next session. Before we move further to the next agenda, for all participants, please fill in the attendance link listed on the chat box. And also, if you have any question, you can fill the question form, the link listed on the chat box. We are now continuing our meeting to the next agenda. That is to hear the keynote speeches with the today first session theme is Environmental Technologies for Sustainable Development Challenge, which will be delivered by ASOC Prof. Dr. Marlia Muhanafiah from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Ian Hollingsworth, PhD, from Horizon Environmental Soil Survey and Evaluation Darwin, Australia, and Dr. Albertus Deni Handoko from Institute of Materials Research and Engineering, Singapore. The keynote speech will be moderated by Dr. Ahyahuddin Sodri, Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development, School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia. Dr. Ahyahuddin Sodri is a lecturer at the School of Environmental Science 2018, Universitas Indonesia. He teaches the courses of sustainable development planning, environmental modeling, food, water, energy nexus, and writing scientific research manuscript. 
He acts as a managing editor of the journal Environmental Science and Sustainable Development GESSD. He holds a doctoral degree in Environmental Science from Universitas Indonesia 2017 by defending his dissertation title, A Dynamic Model of Economic Growth, Mobility and Transportation Energy Towards Low Carbon Cities. His research interest is focused on to environmental modeling, human energy environment, food energy water nexus, and sustainable production and consumption. He has a particular interest in system dynamics and life cycle cost analysis, LCCA. He is also a lecturer at graduate program in biomedical engineering, electrical engineering department, Universitas Indonesia, 2010. To Dr. Ayahuddin Sodri, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Putri. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my fraud to be here. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, good day, and selamat pagi. It's my honor to be a moderator for this uh, remarkable event. First, I would like to express my condolence to all of the victims of COVID-19 around the globe. I also want to express my high appreciation to the medical and non-medical team who is helping the patient for surviving from the COVID-19. Last but not the least, we appreciate government organization and society who hand on hand in this critical pandemic situation. May I request all of you to pray that the pandemic disaster will be overcoming soon. Ladies and gentlemen, today is the second day of our conference with the special topic environmental technologies for sustainable development challenge. This GSD symposium is getting attention from more than 230 papers submitted, more than 30 nationalities participate as authors, reviewer, speaker, and audience. The first day conference yesterday was very successful, getting attention from many participants during the plenary session as well as parallel session. Therefore, we would like to appreciate all of you for who contribute to this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, there are three prominent speakers who will share his knowledge and expertise in this plenary session, I mean for the second day. The first is, like explained by uh, Mrs. Putri, Associate, first is Associate Professor Dr. Merlia Mohamed Hanepia from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, and second is Dr. Ian Hollingsworth from the Horizon and Environmental Soil Survey and Evaluation, Darwin, Australia. And third is Dr. Albertus Denny Handoko from Institute of Material Research and Engineering, Singapore. On the behalf of GESD, Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development, and School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia, we would like to express our high appreciation for all speakers who are coming to our conference today. We want also to express our thanks to all researchers who submit their paper and has been participating in the parallel session. Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand the session to the first speaker, may, may I introduce first the Mrs. Merlia Mohamed Hanepia. Mrs. Merlia Mohamed Hanepia is uh, an associate professor at the Faculty of Science and Technology, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, UKM. She is also a head of Center for Climate Change System, Institute of Climate Change, UKM. She received her PhD degree in life cycle assessment from Red Board University, Nimingen, uh, the Netherlands, in 2013. She has supervised or co supervised. 70 master and 24 bachelor thesis and currently she supervised 30 PhDs in the areas of LCA, wastewater treatment, green technology and sustainability. She is the coordinator of several postgraduate course at her department. Her research project focusing modeling potential and environmental impact of multiple stressor in 
an LCA contact and exploring potential bio-based and nanomaterial for recycling and treating wastewater toward sustainability and circular economy. She has published over 90 peer review paper, book, book chapter, technical report, and serves as peer reviewer for several high impact journal. As a project leader, she has received several international and national grants from various funding agencies with a total amount of more than 4 million. Since 2013, she has been involved in consulting and reviewing criteria document and standard for companies, organization, and government. She is currently conducting transdisciplinary research with a strong interest that integrate various scientific disciplines such as environmental engineering, industrial ecology, toxicity, mathematical modeling, and environmental science. Her ultimate goal is devoted to introducing life, introducing life cycle thinking as a holistic view to assess environmental performance products and technologies to solve fundamental and unprecedented society challenge, especially those related to sustainability. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Associate Professor Merlia Mohamed Hanapia. Professor Merlia Mohamed Hanapia, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the International Symposium of Earth, Energy, Environmental Science, and Sustainable Development Indonesia for inviting me to be one of the speakers for today's event. I'm Marlia Hanafia. I'm head of Center for Tropical Climate Change System, Institute of Climate Change, the National University of Malaysia. So today I'm going to talk about the circular economy uh, topic. So my title for today is From E-Waste to Resources, Unlocking the Circular Economy Potential. So uh, these are the outline of my presentation. So I will first start with a, a brief introduction about the global e-waste generation, and then what are the environmental issues related to e-waste disposal, and then I will um, touch upon the sustainable development goals, and then how LCA could help in uh, managing the e-waste um, sustainably. And then the, at the latter part, I will uh, introduce the e-waste management system in Malaysia and the way forward. So, um, we know that there are so much waste has been produced globally and it was uh, reported that about 2 billion tons of waste has been uh, you know, produced each year uh, worldwide. And uh, do you know that about 99% of the stuff or material that we, that we purchase has been sent to a landfill or trash within 6 months? So we can imagine the lifespan of each product or stuff that we purchase is about six months and then it will end uh, on the earth somewhere. And by, look at, uh, by looking at the e-waste uh, generation, it was uh, reported in 2016, it's about 44 million metric tons of e-waste has been produced. This is an equivalent of almost 4,500 FL tower. Can you imagine the huge amount of e-waste has been produced globally? And this figure shows the, uh, the information about the, uh, the biggest global producer of EWIS um, based on continent and based on countries. So this report has been produced in 2016. By looking at the region, we, we can uh, clearly see that Asia has produced the highest amount of EWIS, about 18 million tons and then followed by Europe by 12 million ton and America and then Africa. And then when we look at the top 10 biggest global producer of EWIS, uh, so it's very obvious to have China and United States um, as the biggest uh, producer of EWIS. And from this top 10 um, uh, biggest producer, we can see Indonesia uh, at the 10th rank. So um, this is to give an overview of uh, the e-waste generation by each country or by each uh, region or continent. And I tried to map the e-waste generation by each country. And so uh, based on the data in 2016, we can see that uh, the e-waste generation is in line with the number of population. That's why we can see that Indonesia has the largest e-waste generation compared to other Asian countries. But when we look at the e-waste generation per person in kilogram, we can see that Brunei has the largest 
if it's generation per person per inhabitant so it's very important to look at the ratio um, of the EV that been produced per person instead of look at the total number as a whole so from this 4 million metric ton of EVs that has been produced globally, only 13% has been recycled. And uh, this is, has been done in developing countries, while the rest, uh, 40, uh, 50 to 80% of these EVs has been sent to the informal recycling markets, especially in China, India, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Um, so you can imagine the issue of improper uh, recycling the uh, EVs that uh, can uh, produce uh, hazardous or harmful emission to the environment that could damage the human health and environment. So we know the electrical and electronic human is part of the solution. We need technology, we need devices, we need instruments to ease our daily routine, to help us in our, uh, to manage uh, our uh, tasks. But if we don't manage this waste properly, it will lead to a problem, to another problem. So we shift from solution to problem if you don't manage the waste properly. There are so many studies have been done, has been reported previously about the implication of improper e-waste management on human health and ecosystem damage. So here I show some example of the previous study that have been done. Most of the study have been done in China, uh, and they look at the at the develop, developing countries uh, e waste treatment. So most of the study and uh, identify the hazard and risk related to e waste treatment. So they compare the formal and informal recycling treatment and uh, try to look at the exposure to human health. So due to the mismanagement of e waste. And uh, by taking one example in China, uh, this area called Gayu, and Gayu is the largest e-waste recycling site in the world, and the city's resident exhibits substantial digestive issue and respiratory problem. And it was found that about 80% of the Gayu children experience respiratory issue. And uh, however, this uh, health implication of e-waste are very difficult to isolate due to the informal working condition, due to the poverty issue and due to poor sanitation issue. That is why we need to understand the cause effect pathway of e-waste disposal. From the e-waste recycling treatment, there are so many processes involved, so many treatment involved. Of course, when we treat the material, the waste, it also produces another byproduct and also other auxiliary substances. And then, of course, it will lead to emission to the air, to water, to soil, um, by fly ash, fine particulates, or effluent, or wastewater. And we know when this hazardous substance uh, penetrates the groundwater, it will end up at the surface water, and then consumed by human, by population, and of course, it will affect the human health at the end, as an end user. That is why when, uh, it's, it's very important to uh, assess uh, the, the impact of the uh, e-waste mismanagement from a holistic perspective. So sustainability aspect element should be integrated uh, in the assessment. So we know that sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their needs. So when we talk about sustainability, it's about three pillars uh, of sustainability which are economic, environmental, and social. So for social sustainability, it always reflects the well-being of the society. For economic sustainability, it related to the economic growth, and for the environmental sustainability, it's about to reduce the dependence on non-renewable resources and to maintain the rate of renewable resources, and of course, to minimize the pollution. So these are the 17 sustainable goals that have uh, been uh, provided uh, with 169 target as part of uh, 2030 agenda. So when we talk about e-waste management, of course, it is relevant to most of the uh, SDGs. So for example, uh, SDGs 1, no poverty, SDG 3, good health and well-being, SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, SDG 13, climate action, SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. So that is why I would like to um, 
promote the concept of circular economy because what we are practicing right now is about uh, is uh, we are following the linear economy where we take we make and we dispose the, the material so um, this is the the type of the model that we have currently but we need to shift or move to a circular economy or we call it as a regenerative system where the resource input and waste emission energy are minimized by a slowing and closing energy and material loops and the circular economy concept can be achieved through long lasting design maintenance and other uh, recycling or remanufacturing of the product or material so these are the example how the electronic uh, EVs uh, from the linear and uh, circular economy perspective. So we know that uh, EVs that have reached the end of their uh, useful life contain very harmful chemical. If end up in landfill, this toxic can um, contaminate into the soil and affect the local environment. But we understand that rapid economic growth and technological advancement in uh, electronic and electrical industry to produce affordable and innovative uh, product are the reason for the increasing consumption of electrical and electronic equipment. Therefore, the topic on managing the end of life of this product has become important in recent years. Uh, it's not only because of the increasing trend in the consumption, but also due to the shorter uh, lifespan of the product. So this is the main issue with uh, e-waste due to the shorter lifespan of this product. And um, of course, it's consequently um, uh, considered as a, one of the fast growing ways uh, uh, in recent years. However, the complexity in uh, waste management is uh, suitable or to, to assess the environment. So, um, here I propose life cycle assessment is one of the environmental tools to assist in decision making on uh, waste management. So how we could internalize the life cycle thinking for sustainable e-waste management? So life cycle assessment, it is a holistic, uh, comprehensive approach where we quantify from raw material extraction to the final disposal. So by having the full supply chain of the product or material, we can identify the hotspot within the, the process. So it is easier for us to, you know, to provide recommendation how we could improve this, uh, this uh, hotspot or limitation by introducing green technology and so So these are the article that uh, my student published recently. Uh, so we overview uh, SAE application in waste management by looking at the current practices, progress and challenges. We also uh, looking at the opportunity for, uh, uh, for an effective waste management in Malaysia and um, also uh, look at the present and future perspective of use management in Malaysia. So, uh, to conduct an LCE assessment, these, these are the framework. So, we have four phases from the goal and scope definition, from inventory analysis, impact assessment, and interpretation. So, in order to holistically quantify the environmental performance of e-waste, we should start from the beginning, for example, from the collection, the, from the transportation and then to the pre-processing. If under the pre-processing, you have several processes like sorting, dismantling, mechanical separation, all this information need to be included in your uh, life cycle assessment. And then uh, for the end processing, mm -hmm. if you have various type of treatment, this also need to be considered so that if the final disposal and at the landfill or generation, this all information mm -hmm. to be considered as well. So we did uh, some overview on the previous study on uh, LCA application in e-waste management. We found about 61 studies. So all the 61 study, they uh, look at three main elements or aspects. Uh, first one is hazardous uh, potential of e-waste management and then uh, e-waste management system and e-waste management strategy. These are the aspects that uh, most of the previous study are uh, interested to, uh, to look into. And by looking at, at the distribution between OECD country and non-OECD country, we found that about 43 studies on this topic has been conducted uh, by OECD country compared to non-OECD, which only about 20 studies. So these are the detail of the countries from OECD and non-OECD. So we can see that China is the leading country that uh, produce 
uh, more study on LCA of e-waste management, while for OECD, we can see that uh, Italy, USA, and Australia are the most dominant countries that are interested to study this aspect from, L from an LCA perspective. And uh, most of the study uh, have been done in developed countries in Switzerland, for example. So they, they found that the treatment and disposal was the major contributor to environmental impact compared to other activities uh, such as collection or transportation of e-waste. And other study by Wager at 2011 also found the, the, the similar result. And um, in China also they, they, they found that uh, the disposal and treatment uh, phase contribute to the larger amount of uh, impact on the environment. And these are also the other example from other countries. Okay, when uh, I would like to give an example how LSA has been conducted, for example, LCA of desktop of uh, PC system. So uh, for the complete life cycle of desktop PC system, we divided into 50% CRT, 50% LCD screen. So used in China during six years. So uh, this uh, LCA also include the e-waste treatment. So you, you have to know the, the component of the desktop PC. For example, if you want to study the LCA of desktop PC system, so you have to know the component involved are speakers, monitor, screen, system unit, speaker, keyboard, mouse, and microphone. So these are the example how the inventory database look like. So when you identify all the component and then identify the input for each component, the raw material use, and then we have to identify the potential emission or output from the input. So we have to map this uh, to develop the inventory so that we can further analyze the impact accordingly. And these are the process tree in lifecycle assessment software. Uh, so how they, they, they show the, the contribution or distribution of the impact per processes or per product or per activity. And these are the example uh, of previous study done by Song in all 2013. So they found the environmental benefit of e-waste recycling in China. So um, it's very uh, obviously saying that um, the recycling activity could uh, produce benefit uh, application to the management of e-waste. And here, um, my group is now uh, looking at the material flow analysis of uh, four different uh, treatment uh, types in Malaysia. So we have a uh, landfill, direct incineration, MRF without energy recovery, and formal MRI. So we, we are interested to, to compare all these four uh, options that are available uh, and look at the environmental performance for each of these treatment uh, options. And we found that uh, there are net environmental uh, net benefit of environmental impact uh, based on the damage category for generation MRF without energy and MRF format. However, there are a negative impact uh, uh, for a landfill uh, treatment. And by looking at very specific impact category, so uh, for landfill, uh, it, it produced environmental burden more on the global global warming, fine particulate matter formation, and human non-carcinogenic. While for other three uh, treatment options, they produce environmental benefit that related to global warming reduction, fine uh, particulate matter formation reduction, and land use reduction, and also human non-carcinogenic toxicity reduction. So what we learned from uh, conducting an LCA of EV recycling system, so we found that uh, the recycling of e-waste has more environmental benefit compared to the uh, the conventional one, uh, such as from landfill and incineration. And uh, but previously, most of uh, e-waste recycling and recovery focused on valuable metals like ferrous and non-ferrous. But little uh, little attention has been uh, has been uh, taken for other. Uh, uh, other recovery such as uh, plastic. So we not only have metal, but we also have plastic. So future study uh, should be done to look at other um, recovery uh, material uh, than metals. So although the increasing recycling and recovery of uh, e-waste showed increasing environmental benefit, but these additional activities during the recycling uh, processes of um, e-waste increase the environmental impact even for formal recycling sector. So that's why we have to fully understand what are the pros and cons, what are the benefits, and, uh, and 
in terms of the the technology we use in terms of the energy we use and etc. So for the e-waste management system in Malaysia, here I show you the distribution of the uh, material recovery facilities and the treatment and final disposal disposal facility that we have in Malaysia, uh, which are uh, equally distributed uh, between the uh, peninsula and uh, Borneo or Malaysia. So these are the model of e-waste flow and recycling system that we have in Malaysia. Most of the industrial sector, they send uh, uh, the waste to the licensed contractor, which are uh, treated at the material recovery facility and then sent to the integrated final treatment and disposal facility. These are the formal recycling system in Malaysia. However, there are other informal um, recycling system that are mostly uh, used by the non-industrial sector, especially from household, where they send it to landfill or in open dump. So, in order to propose a sustainable e-waste management in Malaysia, we identify the challenges in developing and implementing the sustainable e-waste management. So, we found that there are three aspects, main aspects, uh, that um, affect the, the, the development or implementation of the e-waste management. First, the e-waste generation itself, uh, due to the issue of importation of e-waste illegally and legally, and then increasing consumption uh, of e-waste uh, domestically uh, and by manufacturing industry, and then e-waste collection due to lack of collection scheme, due to lack of awareness of consumer, and then the, the third aspect is the e-waste treatment, recycling, and recovery itself due to lack of technological capability and due to the uh, preference of informal recycling sector by household. So these are the challenges that we're having um, right now. So if you can see the trend of estimated e-waste generation in Malaysia from 1981 to 2020, so we can see the increasing trend of the e-waste that been produced. So we know that there are so many problems related to hazardous substances such as from lead, cadmium, chromium, arsenic, and diocene. But we we should also look at the opportunity where we can um, you know recover the valuable material from e-waste itself. So we have non-ferrous metal like gold, silver, copper, palladium, and we have ferrous metal like iron and steel, and also we have plastic, glass. All these available materials should be fully utilized, should be fully extracted, so that we can get or obtain the benefit, or uh, environmental benefit of this uh, EVs, which is not only considered as a problem, but also considered as an opportunity uh, to, you know, to think how EVs can be converted into resources. And these are the framework that we propose that we should start with estimation of previous generation uh, for maybe 20 or 50 years projection and then to analyze the management practices and then of course to examine the environmental and economic benefit and then at the end we have to develop a sustainable e waste management system in Malaysia that could help uh, the government and policymaker to improve the current management. And these are the, the framework or the flow of the development of sustainable waste management system. And um, uh, this is not only about Malaysia. We should you know, close the loop among developing countries by having fundamental and innovative studies toward resource efficiency and optimization, waste minimization and pollution reduction. And uh, we have to uh, understand the complexity in waste management that can be assessed using LCA so that we can identify the hotspot throughout the whole supply chain of the product and we should propose a comprehensive framework of e-waste management so that we can enhance knowledge and learning capabilities and of course we can introduce the suitable incentive and tech, tech scheme on e-waste and of course more effective relationship between various stakeholders and countries members is needed. So opportunity for a circular economy through international collaboration or sustainable and inclusive business among countries members are needed and um, I think we can you know use these platforms to discuss among us so that how we could move uh, forward uh, towards sustainable e-waste management not only in Malaysia but also in other Asian countries. So this is the overview of the project that I'm working on right now. So I divided into three phases. So there are four objectives to be achieved. 
um, of course, to look at the potential resources uh, to estimate the future uh, e-waste generation in Malaysia, to recover valuable metals of e-waste, to evaluate the economic benefit of the uh, metal recovery, and then to determine the environmental toxicity pathway of e-waste um, by comparing the, between recycling versus non-recycling. So these are the, the, the framework that are working right now. So I'm, uh, I welcome anyone who would like to you know, collaborate together so that we can have a very um, a good uh, project uh, together. So uh, with that, I would like to thank you, the organizer, once again for giving me this opportunity to share my work that, that I'm working on right now. So thank you very much and have a good day. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we just uh, finished with the offline presentation uh, from recorded, I mean, recorded presentation from uh, Professor uh, Dr. Marley. Uh, we regret to inform you that just uh, five, five minutes before uh, her presentation, uh, she was not able to join this uh, conference directly. Therefore, we decided uh, to just play the recorded presentation that uh, was prepared before. Uh, therefore, for the question and answer session will be skipped, but we believe because it was a very interesting topic uh, for the first session. If you have question, comment uh, to the first speaker, uh, we invite you to write on the Google form that uh, the address we already put on the chat room. And we will pass your question and uh, comment to uh, Professor Mar uh, Marley Hanapia directly. And we expect that you will get uh, answer and then we'll deliver it by email to, to, to your account. Ladies and gentlemen, after finishing uh, the first uh, topic, and then now we will come to, to the second topic. This second topic will be conducted by, by Dr. Uh, Ian Hollingsworth. And may I introduce uh, Dr. Ian Hollingsworth. Dr. Ian Hollingsworth is a soil scientist with 40 years experience in agriculture extension quantitative soil and land capability assessment, forestry site quality modeling, contamination remediation and mine rehabilitation in Australia, Papua New Guinea, and East Malaysia. His PhD thesis was on designing mine landform using natural analogs to meet biodiversity and cultural land use objective. His Master of Rural Science, uh, Soil Physics Thesis from the University of New England, investigated uh, compaction management and amelioration of UDLs in central western New South Wales cotton growing soil in Australia. His original qualification, a diploma in agriculture science from Hawkesbury Agricultural College, uh, now. Uh, University of Western uh, Sydney trained him in agricultural production system, which has been invaluable in his career. In represented, in represented the soil science profession as vice president of IUWS Commission 4.1 Soil and Environment and author, author for paper in peer review journal, one book chapter and more than 100 technical report and conference paper. He is a professionally accredited soil scientist and erosion and sediment control planner. His consulting specialty is in designing, development, and setting rehabilitation objectives with soil and landscape context in local habitats and land capability in broader environmental setting. His primary field of expertise are soils, water, and land capability assessment for development and remediation planning. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Ian Hollingsworth. Dr. Ian Hollingsworth, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. There is some problem with my uh, video feed 
the background, but if you can put up with that, uh, I'll persevere. It's a great honour to uh, be able to speak at your symposium. My Slima Puggy, uh, my condolences to all the people who have been impacted by this uh, COVID-19 and my uh, greatest respect to the uh, health uh, professionals who are uh, managing the disaster. Uh, we need devices, we need instruments to ease our daily routine, to help us in our, uh, to manage uh, our uh, tasks. But if we don't... Oops, something happened there. My control of my presentation, I think, is under the command of your IT uh, manager. I think I've uh, handed control over to Azar Ferdos. Thank you. So my presentation is on using land capability in conceptual project design for sustainable land use. And it's based on the premise that by conserving land capability and by maintaining the underlying environmental processes that support uh, capable land use, we are sustaining our you know, cultural use of the landscape and its resources and also our uh, environmental and agricultural uh, production systems. And the future can be perceived a bit like a large cro crocodile in a, a murky river, uh, that uh, it is a destructive threat uh, unless we design to avoid it. Uh, like a crocodile in a river, you know, it knows our habits. And uh, if we don't avoid it uh, through good design, we are destroyed by the pitfalls. My training has, uh, is in soil and agricultural science, and it focuses my perspective on environmental process understandings uh, needed to uh, restore landscapes, map soils and landscapes, and design adaphic support for uh, in the environment and agriculture. And I'm going to outline my adaptive applied approach to sustainable solutions that spring from the last 20 years of my career in project consulting and research through University of Sydney. Uh, and uh, I think I'll put forward that uh, considering sustainable design in the conceptual project design stage is the most effective way uh, in terms of gaining regulatory approval for projects and in training the detailed, diverse and costly considerations that are required in the construction planning that follows planning approval. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll just outline my perspectives, which is uh, via a number of uh, case studies. Uh, I've got experience uh, in waste management in Northern Australia where there are large areas that are under native title. So the, the land use, these different land use perspectives I'm going to present range from native title, indigenous land use perspectives, which are framed on their original and very long-term sustainable or subsistence ec uh, economies. And then we've got agricultural developments, which um, range from developing high quality agricultural land, in this case for a sandalwood plantation pro, uh, project, or uh, in another case for cattle, cattle grazing, uh, returning land that's been uh, developed for a coal mine to, to uh, its original land capability, uh, uh, which was for extensive cattle grazing. Then we've got the most demanding situation that I've had to deal with, which was mine rehabilitation for uh, biodiversity objectives and indigenous uh, cultural land use in Kakadu National Park in Northern Australia. Finally, or uh, second last, uh, got urban stormwater design, basically sustainable urban development, respecting the environmental processes underlying landscapes in, in urban situations where the, is the capacity to completely destroy and disrupt natural environmental processes. And finally, uh, plantation forest site quality used to restore forestry following a wind farm development in central Queensland. So these are the different perspectives I'm going to present. Next slide, please. So sustainable design using land capability. Uh, this is the process I developed through my uh, research um, and the, initially it's important to set reasonable goals 
uh, framed on landscape ecology, you know, uh, accurate understanding of broad landscape, hill slope, ecological processes, pedology, the understanding of soil development and processes, soil genetic properties, conservation ecology, the pattern of ecosystems in the landscape and geomorphology, respecting, which is often a primary concern, the pre-existing geomorphic uh, patterns uh, of relief, catchment, conformation, drainage systems in a natural landscape. And this follows on to natural analog selection, identifying reference ecosystems that reliably represent the sort of processes we want to reinstate in our disturbed landscape. Uh, developing conceptual landscape models, particularly water balance models that are accurate. And it's all framed on a digital terrain analysis uh, using environmentally corrected uh, digital elevation models, deriving terrain properties, relief, uh, wetness factors, uh, slope conformations that uh, describe the distribution of water and, and uh, sediment and nutrients through the landscape. Thirdly, to land cover design, designing a reconstructed soil with the edaphic support for the desired vegetation outcomes. This is often done very badly in Australia. Uh, you know, we have uh, a focus on um, ecology without really uh, an understanding of or an appreciation in many situations of the underlying edaphic or soil fertility constraints needed to support particular ecosystem patterns. And then on to design validation, I think it's an important stage, initially uh, validating that the geomorphology of a reconstructed landscape matches uh, the surrounding landscape. And that can be done quite efficiently in a GIS system. Erosion and sedimentation modeling, understanding the budgets and balances in a landscape. Eco hydrology, demonstrating that the water balance of a reconstructed landscape and soil will support our objectives and whether it's a woodland or a, a crop or a cattle grazing uh, vegetation. And then finally, this predictive ecological modeling, which is really I've only found uh, required when you've got very stringent biodiversity compliance requirements. Uh, Range uranium mine is a perfect example. It's in a World Heritage National Park. Uh, it's required to return the landscape to something approaching the surrounding national park without any additional management. So you need to develop a robust ecological modeling framework that's uh, based on good ecological theory, uh, strong modeling methods and uh, a data model that provides sufficient support to do this reliable modeling. Finally, in that situation, there's some synthesis where you can, there's an opportunity, because it is a new field, this design for uh, biodiversity, there's certain ecological engineering applications that need to be developed. And you can prioritize research uh, on species that are, are difficult to uh, model or difficult to uh, sustain. Next slide, please. Could you just advance? Thank you. So now we'll sort of get into the different uh, case studies that I'm going to refer to. The first is to illustrate this uh, sustainable design for indigenous land use uh, based on natural ecosystems and reinstating them at range uranium mine. So in this situation, you've got a tree there, boab tree, a, a food source, You've got a pattern of landscape connected to a surface drainage and you've got fish food sources that need to be harvested or appropriately or uh, you know to support cultural land use in the water so all these systems interact and you need a, a reasonable understanding of how that pattern of land use is going to be re recreated next slide please So the second case study is uh, to restore agricultural land capability in a cattle grazing uh, land use in central Queensland for a coal company, Central Queensland Coal. So they they uh, developing an open cut mine. They have to develop, according to uh, current Queensland legislation, a progressive mine rehabilitation plan where they demonstrate that they have the capacity to reinstate the soil, to support pasture quality and uh, woodland cover depicted in these pictures that are similar to the pre-existing landscape. 
not quite as uh, demanding, but uh, highly uh, legislated uh, because of the huge liabilities that coal mining has entrained in Queensland. Next slide, please. So the third application is a situation that I'm very critical of in my hometown, Darwin, where urban development, which uh, has really uh, fundamentally changed the underlying water balance of the landscape, has required the construction of uh, flood mitigation works. And there are different options, uh, but the one that's been is the paradigm, current paradigm here is end of pipe solution. So the developer develops the land with any respect to the local water balance and uh, the public uh, funds the construction of a large capital works stormwater basin at the outlet. So I'll just go into the benefit cost implications of that and potential low impact development alternatives that put the cost back on the developer or the landowner, a more distributed approach to urban water management. Next slide, please. So the fourth land use objective is from project work that I've done recently on a wind farm development in a Pinus Caribbean plantation, the largest plantation in central Queensland. And the aim is to demonstrate to the regulators that you can restore uh, plantation productivity to these wind farm turbine sites. So there's a con concrete pediment uh, foundation that needs to be rehabilitated to a certain level to sustain the pre-existing forest productivity. Next slide, please. So this is the first uh, biodiversity ecological design that uh, I'll describe for Ranger Uranium Mine. So to start with, you can see a broad landscape. Uh, this is a habitat targeting procedure. This is the basis of the PhD I did with Sydney University under Dr. Inakwu Ode. Uh, it uses, so you can see the top picture, a, an extensive landscape about 40 kilometres long and five kilometres wide, uh, an environmentally correct digital eleva elevation model. Uh, the colour pattern is a, a classification of uh, habitat types based on terrain evaluation of that DEM. I generated different terrain attributes, relief, uh, wetness criteria, um, slope conformation, drainage, it was a range of uh, uh, terrain attributes that reflect the distribution of water and uh, sediment and nutrients through that landscape. And then classified those different terrain attributes using a multivariate non-hierarchical classifier. I guess everyone has their favourites. Some people like fuzzy uh, classifiers. I like this ALOC non-hierarchical classifier in uh, the pattern analysis program, which is very sound. And the, the bottom panel depicts uh, that, that uh, habitat map overlaid with Thiessen polygons, the hexagon patterns that reflect the ecological scale of the mine site. Ranger, the arrow with Ranger attached points to the Ranger mine. Uh, the colour patterns around it reflect areas with the same or similar habitat uh, aerial contributions within that, that Thiessen polygon as the ranger landscape, pre-existing ranger landscape. And you can see there's a number of polygons around ranger that have the same rocky rise type uh, geomorphology, hill, hill slope uh, conformation and habitat pattern as ranger. And there's one site 7J nestled up between high elevation outliers of a surrounding plateau. Uh, and so the second point is we select an analog. In this case, Georgetown analog close to the mine site, which contains all the hill slope variation that's found typically in that right range of mine landscape. And then the third stage is ecological survey support. So designing a survey, it doesn't necessarily have to be all that detailed. We concentrated on soil properties and vegetation uh, presence and absence and abundance rather than detailed um, uh, site 
uh, plot sort of mensuration type data, which can be very uh, expensive to collect. So I think it's more in terms of the number of sites is an important uh, observations of presence, absence of different species can really beef up your uh, modeling effort um, uh, with, um, it's, it's a more critical issue than having detailed information on a fewer number of sites in your ecological survey support. So next slide, please. And coming out of that, you get some design visualization. This is the geomorph geomorphic confirmation of a final landscape. So we're going here from an operational mine with its tailings dams, waste rock, processing area, pits, to a reconstructed landscape that at least respects their waste rock volumes and um, basic backfill containment of hazardous uh, uh, radiological waste and uh, also conforms to local relief patterns and catchment criteria and we can communicate quite uh, constructively with a whole range of stakeholders if we've got a reasonable visualization and some context in the local landscape. Next slide please. So design validation. In this case, it relied on species distribution modeling and then also some demonstration of edaphic support. On the left hand side here, you can see species distribution modeling. I used a generalized additive model for the common and abundant species. That level of support I depicted in the previous slide in terms of the ecological survey support was reliable sort of in terms of predicting 80% of the time accurately what the species was at a site uh, for common and abundant species where we had more than 100 observations of pre species presence in a survey that had 400 sites in it I think. So you know, you're looking at being able to map common and abundant species from a fair survey effort and each of those panels is a particular species. The top left-hand panel is an overlay of all the other panels. So that was to communicate. And the red pattern there is the outline of the uh, mining land use areas, the pits and the tailings and the industrial area. So the, the aim of it was to demonstrate, well, you know, you would have particular woodland species in particular areas. And that's particularly important to the indigenous landowners. They really object to a a rehabilitation plan that doesn't produce a similar woodland pattern. They don't want to walk into a, uh, a swamp woodland of Melaleucas when previously there was a, um, an e a eucalypt woodland on better drained land. So you know, this would or this did uh, provide a first pass in terms of regulatory approval and support for a mine rehabilitation plan. Then on the left hand side there are the results of uh, water balance modelling based on fairly detailed site instrumentation of soil profile water balance, catchment water balance on a waste rock landform with a constructed cover. On the x-axis is annual drainage flux uh, and on the on the y-axis annual drainage flux in millimetres and on the x-axis different design scenarios, cover design scenarios in terms of depth of cover, whether there's a drainage limiting layer or not, uh, whether it's revegetated or not, and you can see quite drastic differences in annual drainage flux depending on the cover design and the support for level of support for revegetation. You're looking for, in this situation, a, um, a, uh, a woodland, uh, you know, requires several hundred millimetres of water to sustain it through a long uh, wet dry cycle. So these were the two aspects that I made a point in terms of the DAFIC support and species distribution modeling in that ecosystem construction approach for more accurate information on rare and endangered species or a larger uh, species assemblage. And typically at this site, there were 100 plus species. You would have to invest in ecological survey. Uh, next slide, please. The next case study was this grazing land capability, maintaining grazing land capability in a coal mine development. It was founded on a soil survey, a standard soil survey according to Australian guidelines, uh, a free survey technique aimed at picking up different uh, landform elements in your soil survey and covering the immediate area impacted by mining, leading to a topsoil stripping and management plan for progressive rehabilitation so that that soil 
can be put back in a reasonably stable landscape that will support cattle grazing land use. So on the right hand side, you can see the soil map, the different colours. The hatching is the mine disturbed area. The um, icons, the point icons are soil survey sites. Uh, and um, yeah, it basically the regional survey, the land system survey doesn't pick up accurately uh, at a site planning level differences in land capability. It was there was poor definition between different uh, alluvial terrace systems along the Styx River that flowed past this uh, development. Uh, so the site survey essentially picked out you know, current floodplain and two alluvial terraces that differed in salinity and sodicity that affected the topsoil and subsoil stripping management that's depicted on the left there. So from the soil morphological and chemical descriptions, we come up with a topsoil and subsoil stripping plan uh, designed to reinstate that uh, cattle grazing, extensive cattle grazing land use. It's not intensive. Uh, next slide, please. And the third project that I'm using to illustrate designing for uh, sustaining land capability is a Racket Creek catchment flood mitigation risk, uh, which has consumed a lot of uh, public resources. Um, $11.7 million reported for construction of flood mitigation basin depicted in that lower plate there to the left of the map. The map shows the flood extent Flooding impinges on half a dozen or a dozen residential lots in the downstream left bank of Rapid Creek. Uh, the bottom area of the map shows a large sort of undeveloped area, Eaton, Marara, which is currently being developed for industrial land uses around our airport, which was going to exacerbate the flood risk to residential property. But instead of managing this in a distributed low impact water sensitive design way, sort of illustrated by that top plate where you've got vegetated um, filters and uh, stormwater uh, sumps and diversion around road infrastructure and um, hard paving. Yeah, the aim to minimize hard paving and where you do have it to treat the runoff uh, locally. And in the bottom plate, you've got the stormwater basin, 25 megalitre stormwater basin. I reviewed the benefit cost of that, 0.6. So, and that's all funded by the sale of public assets. This is a road into the crocodile's mouth, basically, I think. And then in the bottom there, there is the water balance, the underlying environmental process that you're trying to address. On the left or on the right, you've got the natural water balance. You've got trees using most of the rain that falls in evapotranspiration. We've got a rainfall of 11, 7, 1720 millimetres. Vapid transpiration from woodland in the analogue area is a bit over a metre and 400 metres, millimetres per year reporting to the creek. Uh, in the development scenario, where you've got uh, paving, uh, hard roofing and no on-site distributed amelioration of, of uh, runoff and shallow through flow, you have almost three times the amount of runoff reporting to the creek, which we are at the moment mitigating by investing public money in a end of pipe stormwater basin. Next slide, please. This should be the fourth case study, the forest wind farm rehabilitation project. So in this, the aim was to, oh, I don't know what they are, demonstrate uh, Adaptive support for uh, forestry in a wind farm project, uh, uh, 226 wind farm turbine sites. That's the slide, number 13. Thank you. So yes, on the left hand side there, I've got the wind farm turbines plotted over a 3D, draped over a model. And uh, those sites across different uh, land capability units. Uh, the aim was to uh, look at a DAFIC support. This is at a project approval stage for restoring land capability for Pinus Radio, not Pinus Radio, Pinus Carabia, uh, once the wind farm would be de de decommissioned in 60 years' time. So I looked at different data sources for looking at 
soil properties. The first was digital soil mapping product of plant available water content. This is available over the whole of Australia. It's the uh, uh, soil grid mapping produced by CSIRO. It's a 50 metre grid of soil attributes, including plant available water content down to two metres. And I also looked at legacy site quality survey data, which I found to be more reliable. And then we developed a remediation design for the wind farm turbine pads that met the regulators requirements of conserving pro forest productivity. In the panel below of different graph panels, I've got mean range standardized forest productivity on the y-axis. So uh, range standardized forest productivity measurements, measurements from the uh, state forests from zero to one to get some reliable comparative uh, framework for looking at the data. And in each panel, we've got, got different um, soil and landscape attributes that we assessed in terms of being able to predict the effect of reducing soil depth uh, on different, um, on restoring forest productivity. The first panel is available water content from that uh, Australian uh, digital soil mapping modeling. You know, available water content is directly related to forest productivity in all the uh, extension information on Pinus Caribbean, but you can see there's no relationship. It's uh, very disappointing. And each of the other panels we've got, uh, particularly for impedance layer depth, a strong relationship with uh, forest productivity and mirrored relationships for slope position and drainage class It all factored into our rehabilitation design. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, I recommend using a reliable ecological model. It doesn't have to be the most elaborate. It doesn't have to be based on digital soil mapping, which is downloadable for the whole globe now. Select natural analogs and appropriate ecological scale. Provide a DAFIC support for vegetated surfaces that you desire in your rehabilitation. Next slide, please. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, Universitas Indonesia and the journal for inviting me to speak today. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Inaku Ode, the late Dr. In O'Day, my friend and collaborator, uh, Central Queensland Coal, ERA Ranger Mine, MBAC Forest Consulting, and Buyong Forest Sciences. Thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Ian Hollingsworth. It was very interesting topic, on my opinion. And now I invite the participant to raise question or comment by uh, filling the document. I think the committee has already informed on the chat room how you could raise your question or comment or comment. Uh, Dr. Ian, there is uh, one question from the audience uh, about the predictive ecological modeling. Uh, could you please further explaining uh, what is the advance to the uh, conventional ecological modeling? Well, it's, it is conventional ecological modelling. It's just really the innovation is that it's not regularly used in mine rehabilitation planning. At least in Australia, the paradigm seems to be to assess ecological diversity, uh, usually you know, with a, a large and detailed species list and detailed plot surveys of uh, uh, abundance as well as presence absence information. But the underlying design is left to the mining engineers. So you often end up with a, like a uh, Mexican Mesa or a pyramid design that is environmentally stable. Uh, it's uh, stable against erosion, but there's no ecological perception or modeling of what that entrains. So you end up with a, a complicated rehabilitation plan, revegetation plan that often fails. You don't get the biodiversity that you expect in uh, some sites because the drainage uh, of the soil and landscape is not covered properly. You get uh, a swamp woodland instead of a dry woodland. So you know, it, it sort of raises questions with uh, the um, traditional owners. So I've basically used essentially uh, conventional predictive ecological modeling. I used uh, a GAM modeling system that uh, really I, I, I took from uh, conservation ecologists uh, in New Zealand at the University of Auckland and applied that. Uh, there was really nothing uh, innovative about the ecological modeling. I just made sure that through the environmental survey work that we had support for predictive modeling of outcomes. That was really the innovation. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, there is also another question. Uh, I think you uh, hear this question is concerned to the application of the model for the catchment of flood risk mitigation. Uh, in Indonesia, right now, is there is, let's say, a large, uh, let's say, development of toll road or highway road, mm. uh, and several times it was uh, impact to the flooding. How you see the opportunity to use, let's say, the, the modeling for, for, for this kind of application? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, it, it really is very uh, site specific. Uh, in my situation, Darwin is a small town, uh, and the point I'm making is that uh, sustainable design in urban areas needs to respect uh, the natural water balance. That's the point I'm making. I think it's done very well in Singapore. You know, they have um, large uh, arterial road systems, and they intercept the runoff from the road in vegetated uh, uh, water gardens. Uh, so it's, it's making a point of slowing down the, the runoff from the road, uh, filtering it through some vegetated uh, system to filter out metals or any potential contaminants, and then providing uh, the short term storage, perhaps in some sort of system system, it all depends on the location uh, to try and conform to a reasonably natural water balance. I think that's the point I'm making. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, in, in, in the context in Northern Australia, the, uh, the planning and infrastructure department here, their argument is that water sustainable, sensitive urban design, low impact development isn't practical because um, we have large uh, flood flows, but it is practical in Singapore. It's just a matter of devolving controls through the catchment. I started my work in agricultural extension, erosion sediment control in rural areas where we had the same problem, but it was related, related to over clearing. So people would clear their farms, you would get triple the runoff, just similar to an urban setting. And then uh, the uh, reservoirs, town supply reservoirs would be clogged with sediment. So our way of addressing that was to restore the water balance. It's the same in urban areas. Instead of letting the stormwater go to waste, you need to reuse it and uh, store it in whatever on-site storages uh, you, you can. Essentially, it's the the responsibility of the infrastructure department to manage their runoff. I think that's the main point. Okay, uh, now we are waiting also for uh, another question from the participant for the committee. Please the, pass the question to my attention. Maybe you can send it to, to my watcher. Okay, there is uh, another question about the application for forest wind farm rehabilitation. Uh, could you please maybe uh, explain, let's say, what the progress, I mean, uh, is already applicable, uh, applicate this project in, in Australia, how, let's say, to use uh, this model for this uh, wind farm rehabilitation for maybe in other countries in Southeast Asia? Well, that's uh, another good question. This is a very, we had to keep it simple. I mean, um, essentially, we're just restoring the soil fertility in those wind farm pads. The, the pads had to be structurally very, um, you know, the very uh, highly designed foundations. The turbines, they're large turbines. I think they're 50 meters high or something like that. So they've got concrete foundations going into the soil. Now different options for rehabilitating the concrete structures. And we looked at uh, the forest, state forests, uh, productivity data, they record productivity from mensuration plots through their forest. I'd make the point that forestry are an excellent uh, land user to work with because they often have very good yield information that you can then relate to soil properties. So in this situation, that's what I've done. I've related their productivity data to also their soil survey data, which I could criticise, but it was much more informative than the CSRO model digital soil mapping data of plant available water content. So trees respond to water supply in this wet dry environment. They have to sustain their growth through a drought every year, a dry season. Uh, it's a bit different in most of Indonesia where you have two wet seasons, but here we have a, a, a dry um, southeasterly trade wind essentially through winter. And um, oh, yeah, so 
forest productivity you would expect to be related to available water content, but the model data is very poor. You know, a lot of work has gone into this modeling across Australia by CSIRO, produced this gridded uh, digital soil modeling information that nowadays people tend to download and apply. It's really only in situations where you have good yield information, like from a forest, you can actually evaluate it. Um, you know, uh, there's a tendency to use the most tech technically elaborate models to justify a particular uh, project approach. But in this case, it would uh, not really inform your sustainable design as well as just using the historical land survey information of slope position, soil depth. Soil depth was critical. Um, the shortfall in the model data, the available water content was the fact that there wasn't much survey support in the state forest. The soil surveyors, who uh, provided the data, the survey support for the CSIRO modeling had concentrated on agricultural land. Uh, so you've got to be able to perceive the shortfalls of a lot of these modern uh, digital soil mapping products. Um, and I would um, really uh, emphasize that uh, you rely on a good site survey support, the same sort of support that uh, approach that I really developed for the ecosystem reconstruction at range of uranium mine, you know, that's not required, but you need to have a, a reliable model, even if it's simple. Okay. You could use it in Southeast Asia you know, or anywhere, really. It just is, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not particularly complicated. It just means making reasonable observations of production and uh, edaphic support in the soils that you've got. And a lot of these tropical soils, it's really soil water store and the ability to cut cycle nutrients through the topsoil that is the two important aspects of maintaining land capability, I think. Okay, uh, the next question is, I think is still related to the previous question. Uh, it's coming from uh, Mr. Hernani from University of London. And he raised two questions. Uh, what method is the best use for uh, drainage uh, flux management? And second question is, can forest wind farm be applied in post mining? I suppose it's related to the previous question, yes? or Yeah, I think so. In that particular forest, it's sort of very, uh, the landscape is unique. You know, every situation is different and you've really got to look at the landscape, the geomorphology. It's deep weathered terrain. Mm adjacent to this big block faulted uh, syncline type um, Eastern Australian dividing range. It's very deeply weathered Cretaceous, deep weathered meta sediments and uh, metamorphic rocks. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not fertile, that's what I'm trying to say. And there are jury crusts. So there are cemented layers in the soil profile in the regolith, the deep regolith. There are ferry cretes. Uh, there are what we call spodic horizons in soil science. There are iron, aluminium, organic cements. So this depth to uh, depth to impedance layer, which determines the rooting depth and the plant available water supply for growing the timber, is a significant constraint to forest productivity. I might not have got this across all that well, but I mean, this was, the wind farm has the option of rehabilitating, spending uh, different amounts of money on either removing totally these wind farm foundations or taking off the pedestals that the, the uh, turbine uh, towers are bolted to, giving them say half a metre of uh, soil to push back on top or, grinding it back a bit further and then blasting the uh, remaining foundation to provide some drainage. And we ended up recommending uh, grinding it back, removing the pedestal, providing one meter of uh, soil cover back over a fractured uh, pedestal, a fractured foundation. So blasting the foundation in situ, providing some drainage. So I think drainage accounted for 10% of productivity loss from that mean effects model and uh, soil depth accounted for 20% of uh, productivity loss. We just added the two together in that mean effects, assuming uh, a normal probability distribution, the effects are additive. So all up, you get a 30% productivity loss that you can um, uh, uh, manage or, you know, uh, by the way you treat the wind farm uh, rehabilitation. As I say, we kept it simple. So it could be applied across different projects and different approaches will apply in different situations. There might be some situations where plant available water measurements are reliable and there's good site-based survey information. 
that's probably the emphasis, the, the emphasis that I would make that you really do need site-based survey information. You can download globally this derived uh, global soil map data or in the Australian context, the Australian soil map grid, but you need to be very careful with it. It's uh, often not well supported depending on where you are. Dr. Ian, I believe uh, there is still a lot of things that uh, interest to be discussed here. Yeah. But right. unfortunately, the time is up. And then now I have to step up to the next uh, presenter. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian, for your time, your sharing knowledge and, 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 and experience in this uh, plenary session. A great pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will uh, invite the third speaker, uh, Dr. Albertus uh, Handoko. Dr. Albertus Handoko is affiliated to the Electronic Material Department, Institute of Material Research and Engineering, ASTAR, ASTAR Singapore. And his Doctor of Philosophy uh, in Materials uh, from Nanjiang Technological University, Singapore. And he earned also his Bachelor of Engineering still in the material from the same university. And he is uh, experiencing uh, in continuous export to the latest development in material and catalyst research over 15 years of experience in collaborative research with national and international universities and research institutions. Uh, mentored uh, more than 27 undergraduate, magister and PhD uh, level research project. He is excellent writer and presenter uh, to patent application, uh, 50 paper, 17 poster or oral presentation with more than 3,300 citation. Uh, H index is uh, 24. And ladies and gentlemen, I think he has also other activities. Uh, I think out, uh, understanding outstanding review for Material Horizon 2019, uh, invited delegate for world-class Indonesian diaspora scientists in 2019. Uh, most viewed paper in Catalyst Science and Technology 2016, Best, Porters, Best Poster Award at uh, MRS Singapore Meeting 2010, uh, selected for the fourth Asia Ocean Asia Forum for uh, Synchrotron Radiation Research 2010 in spring, uh, Japan. Uh, the most update of publication record uh, accessible via Google Scholar. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome. Dr. Albertus Handoko. Dr. Albertus Handoko, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Sorry, I need to stop this share screen because I cannot find the unmute button just now. Okay. So I hope you, you all can see my screen. So today I am going to share yeah, with you. Your screen is clear. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, please continue. Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So first, uh, uh, of course, I want to uh, uh, appreciate the invitation that uh, the University of Indonesia, especially from the School of uh, Environmental Science and the organizing community, uh, Dr. Sodri and Dr. Hedriansa, to extend the invitation to me to share a little bit about my work in the Institute of Material Research and Engineering. It is a little bit different. Uh, it's a little bit different angle uh, from what this conference is 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 talking. But it's we we are it's just like a different approach to achieve a more sustainable way to produce energy and uh, sustainable su sustainable uh, chemical production. So today we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about electrocatalysis. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, we, 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 we can together learn uh, these three points. So how can catalysis uh, help in, in uh, forming a more sustainable energy landscape? And I'm going to introduce you a little bit about this uh, new types of two-dimensional two material called maxines and how it is uh, applicable to hydrogen evolution catalysis and CO2 reduction catalysis. And I'm going to like just give an idea about what's the general outlook in the future for CO2 catalysis. So we have 
uh, one of the biggest motivation, of course, for a lot of uh, studies in these days are the climate change. And uh, uh, in people's minds, uh, people, uh, cl climate change is like increasing temperature. But it's not just increasing temperature, but it's increasingly uh, uh, very big change in the weather pattern. Like for example, we see more often like uh, forest fires uh, again in uh, United States and Australia. And then we see like more violent uh, uh, tornadoes and, and hurricanes uh, on both sides of the Pacific. And the data is very clear. So we, we see like a, um, a steady increase of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere from the, the, from the very beginning of the record. And it's actually uh, like it's, uh, we should be doing something about it. And one of the key in our research uh, group is uh, catalysis. So we have many studies, many works uh, in capturing, for example, CO2 as waste and trying to sequester it, like uh, just store it underground or store it under, under the water, under seawater. But we are thinking, uh, rising from the idea of the circular economy, we actually can actually reuse uh, and convert CO2 to something uh, that can be useful, for example, as a fuel or a chemical like uh, hydrogen, ethylene, ethanol, and, and so on and so forth. So, if you see from uh, the slides here, this, this slides, if you if you if you need to take the takeaway the key takeaway message, uh, if you cannot remember what my presentation is today, so this this is probably the slides that you should take home with you. So this is kind of like the 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 key the dream picture of what we want to achieve. So how cat uh, catalysis can be in the heart of uh, the circular economy, especially for the carbon waste the recycling. So whatever that we, the dream is, whatever that we produce from the power plant waste or the car waste, whatever, can be recycled through catalysis. And then it goes back uh, to be to something that can be again used in vehicles, in power plants and everything. Now, the, the heart of the, the catalysis, the heart of my uh, research is actually electrocatalysis. And then electrocatalysis is actually a very old uh, field. So it has much more than 230 years of history. So one of the earliest uh, record in the published journal is in 1789. So in, in these two, two authors uh, from Dutch, from the Netherlands, they, so they report some phenomenon that they, they, they see when they pass through some static electricity to some a metal rod immerse in the in the electrolytes containing a sodium chloride uh, 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 micro solution then they see bubbles on the end of the at the end of the road so basically they report that they, they it, when they when they add electricity to a metal rod and in inside the electrolyte they can form something some gas so this is the first formal report of electrocatalysis of water splitting of course there could be earlier uh, experiments that has been done by, by researchers at that time. But I, I think to my knowledge, this is probably one of the earliest uh, uh, formal report in the journal. We have uh, gone very uh, far from uh, the 1789 paper. Now we know that actually hydrogen evolution reaction can be uh, viewed as a, as a two steps reaction. So basically the proton on the surface, it gets absorbed to the surface of the catalyst. So if, if you have two, uh, because the hydrogen molecule contains two hydrogen, so you have two absorption steps. And then the next step is basically simply just uh, a release of uh, hydrogen after the bonding has been uh, formed between the two hydrogen atoms. So this means that the activity of the electrocatalysis of hydrogen uh, reaction can be simply related to the binding energy. How strong is the hydrogen is binding to the surface of the catalysis? And we have this uh, um, a French uh, scientist called Sabet uh, Sabetier that 
the because the activity can be related to the binding energy if the binding energy of the hydrogen is too strong to the to the catalyst then the hydrogen will the desorption step is actually very difficult but if the if the binding energy is too weak to the surface of the catalyst then this step will be very very difficult so in essence the the peak performance of the catalysis will be uh, will be can be found at the intermediate binding energy where the binding is actually not very strong or not very weak. So th this is known as the Sabatier's principle in the, in the chemistry, uh, or more informally, this can be known as a volcano plot, because as you've seen that if you see that there's a peak performance in the center, then it goes down when it, the binding energy is weak, and then it goes down when the binding energy is very, very strong. Why I bring out this one is because hydrogen is, has been known as uh, one of the few options that can be a clean energy carrier and feedstock. So it can already be used in stationary fuel cells. It is very important, the feedstock for chemicals, like for example, plastics that we, we see and use every day today. Uh, it can also be used as energy storage in fuel cells, uh, in cars, uh, and in small devices, even now, uh, especially important in remote area that does not have uh, uh, access to uh, grid electricity for a very long time. There is also a, a plan to make like uh, hydrogen fuel cell fueled uh, airplanes. Uh, I think I just re read from the news like a few weeks ago that Boeing is uh, trying to uh, develop this uh, a fuel, fuel cell based uh, airplane. For this, because uh, the motivation, okay, because most of the uh, most of the materials that is excellent for hydrogen air fusion catalyst in the top of the volcano cloth is very expensive and rare. For example, in this in this area, we have platinum, rhodium, rhenium, and uh, and uh, rhodium. Uh, these are very very rare and very very expensive and very very difficult to extract metals. So one of our motivation is to find something else that can potentially replace this platinum or palladium with something that is cheaper. So I came across this material called Maxines. Uh, this Maxines is uh, founded in 2000, somewhere in 2010 or 2011 by uh, this person in the center. Here, this is called uh, Yuri Gogotsi. This is me. This is uh, one of our, our, also our collaborator in Avery. Uh, so this person and together with uh, another professor called the Bars Michael Barsum, they, they discovered that if they treat this material, this is a titanium aluminum carbide layered material. This has been used many times in uh, uh, heat protection material in airplanes uh, and the very high uh, hardness material. If, the, if, we, if they treat this into hydrogen fluoride, HF, and then it will selectively remove the aluminum from the inside of the material here, and then it will form naturally as like a layered material. Uh, and then once they remove the aluminum, then it become from titanium three, aluminum carbon two, then it will become titanium three carbon two with the TX. TX is representing the outside of the, of the surface of the term surface termination group. It can usually be oxygen or hydroxyl and or fluorine. So this is it, it's a very big deal because this is one of the first uh, few uh, two-dimensional material after graphene uh, that can be pro processed using a solution method. So you can make kilograms of it in a very short time and it's very reliable. So you, you can see it, it's already naturally layered in the precursor material once you exfoliate it you can see that it's actually very, very high layered. We are very interested in this material because this, if you have very uh, high layered material, that means your surface area is very high and then it will potentially, will be able to uh, perform a lot of uh, interesting catalysis uh, reactions. Oh, before I go to the previous slide. So this is just a little bit of, uh, advertisement. So if you want to go to good conferences, you don't have to go to America or you don't have to go to Europe. We have, uh, we have a very good conference called the IC, uh, IC Met. 
in Singapore. So this is this is the focus is a little bit material centric, but there is a lot of like uh, uh, good speakers. We also have invited uh, Nobel laureates to speak in this conference. So next time you can probably consider to go to ICMED uh, when the travel is already open. So this is the the next slide will show you like the, the exact. Uh, uh, so we talk about vaccines previously, and then I try to we in our group we try to apply these vaccines to perform actually perform the hydrogen evolution reaction. We did uh, the FT calculation uh, with the collaboration with our uh, friends in Institute of Higher Performance of Computing and also in Beihang University and also in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania University in the United States. The, if you remember the volcano curve that I showed earlier, so some of the materials of the vaccine is actually also, uh, also in the apex. So that means it's potentially, this material can also be used in to replace platinum and palladium as a hydrogen evolution catalyst. So one of the, one of the uh, strategy that we employ is try to combine uh, this vaccine with another 2D materials called the MOS2. Uh, we, try, we try like a in-situ sulfidation, just put sulfur on top of the vaccine that we, we, we synthesize. And then after that, we, we, we use uh, TEM and XID to, to characterize it. But the most important takeaway, slide, takeaway uh, in this slide is actually the performance. So as I said before, uh, platinum is the gold standard or rather the platinum standard for hydrogen evolution. So here in our catalysis, we can, we can actually get very, very near to the platinum performance. So the onset potential is only 0 0.1 volt uh, worse than the platinum. It's still worse, but we need to consider that the titanium carbon is probably 1000 times uh, cheaper than platinum, even after you mix it with the carbon material like this, so it's 20% platinum and carbon. And then another important point is that some cat in some catalysis uh, publications, you only they only report, okay, the onset of the, uh, the catalysis is at this voltage, but they rarely see that how much higher, how high your, your catalysis can go. Like for example, in here, we can actually uh, demonstrate that this catalyst can, can actually perform hydrogen evolution up to like more than 400 million ampere per centimeter square. So this, this means that it can be applicable to industrial scale and it's not so bad compared to the platinum and it's 1000 times cheaper. So Maxine's has not been just used in hydrogen evolution catalyst. So this, uh, since the, the discovery in 2010 or 2011, he has been applied in many uh, different applications. Like for example, when it's combined with uh, transition metal compounds, it's very useful for uh, to be used in metal air battery, which is also a key uh, a strategy for, for energy storage. Uh, like for example, if you want to harvest uh, um, energy from the solar, by using a solar panel, uh, you need to be able to store it somehow so that you can use it in the night when the sol when the when the sun is not shining, and there's a lot a lot of other uh, applications in the vaccines as well. So here are a few examples. Like for example, this is our material. So vaccine combined with MIS2, and then there's also vaccine combined with Yao2, where you can use it as a photocatalyst. The next topic is uh, CO2 reduction. So previously we've been talking about uh, converting water into hydrogen that you can use as an energy carrier. We also uh, been researching a little bit about the CO2 conversion into uh, usable chemicals. So this is also using uh, electrochemistry. So you see here, these are actually the chemical part. Uh, the numbers uh, indicate how many electrons you require to convert CO2 to your product, for example, methanol here or methane, you require eight electrons and then ethane also ethanol and ethylene, you require 12 and 14 electrons uh, respectively. So the key here is actually we can convert CO2, which is a waste to something that is more valuable that we can use also in the, in, as an energy carrier and also uh, feedstock chemical. 
Uh, this is the, the small scale uh, CO2 reduction setup in our lab. So it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not yet industrial scale, but this is where we uh, discover, we look at the fundamental properties of the, of the catalyst. So when we try to modify the surface of catalyst, then we, we, we put them in this side and then we flow through the CO2 uh, through, the, through the liquid. And then we do a peri periodic sampling using a gas chromatography to quantify really how much of the CO2 is actually being converted into uh, ethylene or ethanol or something like that. We also use like NMR to quantify the liquid product uh, because this GC is only capable to do, uh, to detect the gaseous product. We also did a simple uh, CO2 reduction uh, life cycle analysis. This is a very simplified version. It's just a cradle to gate. This is uh, with a collaboration of uh, our friends in the Institute of Chemical Engineering Sciences. So it's not, the, the finding is not surprising. So the key the takeaway message from these slides is that regardless how, how good is the idea that we can actually, I tell you that we can convert CO2 to something that is useful. We have to use a renewable electricity source. Regardless in the small scale or the large scale, the small scale is uh, projecting a, a product of one gram of ethylene and the large scale is projecting a product of one ton of ethylene from CO2. If we do not use if we just use grid electricity, especially from the natural gas uh, uh, source uh, of uh, electricity that is commonly used in Singapore, the GWP potential, this is the green greenhouse, uh, uh, glo the global warming potential is actually positive. So that means by actually doing this CO2 conversion, if we use just the grid electricity is actually contributing to more CO2 uh, into, the, into the atmosphere, not reducing. But there are some scenarios that is encouraging. Like for example, if we use the power, uh, solar power and then renewable hydrogen as uh, one of the, uh, the, the energy carrier and the storage, then the global warming potential can be negative. And there is also some scenario that if you use uh, uh, waste to energy plant, there's also a, a negative global warming potential can also be uh, achieved. So I think I'm gonna end with this slide. So in the catalysis, because my, my point of view, I, I, I'm, I'm trained in material science and chemistry. So I, I, I actually think that the way forward is actually to do an operando technique. So the operando technique means that we need to look at the uh, catalyst when it is performing the catalysis. So we have means to do it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, central facilities in around Southeast Asia, Australia, and Europe and US that we can actually do a synchrotron radiation studies that we can actually look at the catalyst as and when they are doing the catalysis studies. And then we actually can be a little bit more certain uh, whether they are really doing a catalysis or it's just like a normal chemical reaction and what is actually the state of the catalysis so that we can design a better, cheaper and more reliable catalyst in the future. So I'll end with this uh, and you can contact me with email and I will be happy to answer whatever questions that you may have. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Albertus Handoko. It was a very interesting uh, topic that you presented here. I believe, I think uh, it will uh, raise question, many questions from, from, from uh, audience. And there is one first, okay, the first question is coming. Uh, I think so the material mixing that you present here, it seems that will, let's say, uh, a revolution to the energy carrier or storage. And the question is, is what's the, the barrier 
what is still barrier to, to let's say to bring your invention to to the commercial one okay it's a good question the first thing i need to make a disclaimer this is not my invention so the the inventor is the the, the person that i uh, showed the picture uh in the previous slides uh, this uh that person is called uh, professor gogotsi in the, from the drexel university in, uh, in the united states so uh one of the key uh, rate determining factor um kind of like not really preventing but maybe it's it's an engineering challenge because uh it is still required uh, very strong acid the very strong acid of hydrofluoric acid is still required to uh, produce this maxine from the uh, the precursor material so because fluorine uh, ion is the only way uh, for you to dissolve aluminium selectively uh, without dissolving the titanium so this is one of the key challenge to bring uh, like in industrial scale of production of this maxine so but they have already uh, like uh they have already like also make like automated process they can do like a pump so that they can circulate uh safely hf and then the the precursor material so that you can you can produce in kilograms or even 10 kilogram scale uh per day so yeah, so that is one of the, the main uh, difficulties, which is the handling of uh, hydrogen fluoride safely. And then the, the process is actually still quite long. So like you need to produce, like you need to immerse it in HF for about three to three days to seven days, something like that. Because if I refer to your presentation, I think it was, you mentioned a uh, thousand times cheaper. Is it correct? Yeah. Well, because the, con the 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 comparison is platinum, uh, doctor. Okay, so the platinum. Bit, okay. Yeah. Okay. So compared to the platinum, platinum okay. yeah, platinum is actually the the industrial catalyst to produce hydrogen from uh, electrocatalysis right now, and then I I think platinum is also very rare, and then the the price per kilogram is also very very expensive. Titanium, on the other hand. It's a little is I think it's probably ten or one hundred times more abundant, but in terms of price, uh, it's it's much much cheaper. I think I believe it's in the order of one thousand times cheaper per uh, unit mass. Okay. Uh, the second question is I think uh, is connect your presentation to the first presentation discussing about e waste. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you consider also your your research, let's say, to reduce e waste? I mean. Uh, in the application as electrical batteries, I think, do you consider also the e-waste? I mean, this is better or, or how you, do you see? It's the question from audience. Okay, so I think we have not really considered the e-waste the e question, but I do understand where the question is coming from because now we are looking at uh, a lot more uh, electronic devices that contains uh, batteries and then these batteries dies after some time. We also have like groups that is uh, working on this uh, research at the moment. So now most of the chemistries of the batteries is the rechargeable batteries is based on lithium, yes. but the lithium has mm -hmm. uh, some uh, some problem in safety and also that when you want to dispose uh, the the battery, then this is this causing a problem. So we are we are also researching uh, about a battery using a higher valence. Uh, ions like for example magnesium battery and also uh, aluminium battery and then also uh, the metal air battery so this is a little bit different so it's more like the wet cell that you have in the old cars and maybe in the 90s where you pour in like uh, sulfuric acid inside the cell and then after that uh, the, the, the electrodes will be able to store the, the, the energy in terms of chemical so we are also researching on that. So the focus is not really uh, how to deal with the e-waste after the battery is died, but we are trying to research how we can make uh, the battery capacity a little bit higher and a little bit more durable so that we can actually reduce the amount of waste. Okay, uh, thank you. 
the next question is uh, coming here. Okay, I have to read it. Um, are there any side products or effects of methanol production by this electrochemical method? And what are the future development plans of this method? Yeah, that is a very good question. Electrochem electrochemistry is actually really very clean. So if it's done in the aqueous solution, that means it's in water plus like some inorganic salt, the byproduct and the comp or rather the competition is really just hydrogen. So if we want to produce uh, methanol from CO2, so ideally um, the percentage of the electricity going from CO2 to methanol is as high as possible. But if we do it in aqua solution, the presence of water is also a competition because as you see, hydrogen evolution and CO2 reduction is at the same side of the reaction. So it's both are the reduction reaction. Hydrogen evolution is actually easier to do because the, the energy requirement is actually lower compared to the CO2 reduction. So the byproduct really is just how we minimize the, un, the unwanted hydrogen production. And then we drive, we design the catalyst that can drive uh, CO2 reduction rather than hydrogen evolution. The, the future of this technology is still a little bit, um, it depends what product are we talking about. We ha I have seen uh, some larger scale uh, production in terms of ton scale of conversion from CO2 and water to CO and hydrogen. So that means CO and hydrogen is basically, uh, is, a production, is a production gas that you can use for forming polymers. I think this is, I, can, I cannot remember what the gas is called, but basically um, it's, it's, a, it's a greener method alternative to the reverse water gas shift the reaction to produce CO plus hydrogen mixture. So this uh, plant has been, uh, I've seen one plant in uh, Norway and I think there are several plants in, in China as well. And it's actually from the, from the LCA studies of the, for, for the bigger, a scale, as I mentioned before, if the source of the electricity is clean, so the, 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 the global warming potential is actually negative and it's actually very good uh, prospect for this to be developed in, in larger scale. But, okay. for the, but for the more complicated products, like for example, methanol or ethanol or ethylene, this is still largely in development uh progress so there's not much of industrial scale yet okay uh this is the next question is uh coming from audience uh, i have to read Okay, sorry. I think uh, I was interrupted. Hello. Hmm. Yeah, okay. hi. Uh, I will repeat again, Dr. Albertus. Uh, there is a uh, next question is coming. How much is the production capacity of graphene material by electrolysis method? Could this method also be used to produce uh, carbon nanotubes? Okay. The, uh, uh, okay, the production of, I, I didn't actually talk about the production of graphene material and carbon nanotubes using electrochemistry, but it is possible. Uh, I don't know whether, I, I think especially graph, graphene uh, or graphene oxide can be done because if you just use a carbon-based uh, electrodes on the anode, then it, the production is actually very, 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 very fast and efficient. Carbon nanotubes, I'm not very certain because uh, carbon nanotubes, you need to close the, you need to close the chain and form the tubular, tubular form of the, of the SP3 bonding. Uh, I'm not sure whether this can be done uh, very easily on the, on the using electro, electro, electrochemistry, but graphene 
for for sure it's it it can be done okay uh, thank you very much dr albertus handoko i think uh, it's still interest you know to to share experience uh, answering question and so on but yeah. the time is up unfortunately so i could not extend this discussion okay uh, ladies and gentlemen we end up with the third uh, speaker so I will not uh, summarize uh, all of the discussion that we did uh, today, uh, but from all of the presenter, I think we we'll learned a lot how the environmental technology uh, could serve uh, in the achievement of the sustainable uh, development challenge. I think this is maybe on my opinion, this is the, the, the main conclusion. And again, as the Moderator, I would like to thank you again for all of the presenter or all of the uh, keynote speaker who is willing to share their knowledge and experience, their, uh, let's say, progress in research in this, uh, let's say, uh, good time. And for all of the participants who attend this uh, plenary session and also raise, I think, uh, many, many uh, valuable questions and comments, we appreciate. Uh, hope, let's say, we could uh, talk again or we could see again in, in another uh, event. Um, now, I will hand over uh, the session to the Mrs. Putri Alvenia. So again, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you again and talk to you later. Thank you, Dr. Ayahuddin Sori. It's very interesting topics and discussion. We can make it as a learning experience and hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for all the participants. Now we've arrived in the middle of the event. The next session is a lunch break. Then we will continue again at one o'clock in the afternoon of Indonesian time, GMT plus seven, with a research talk of waste management in Indonesia. Session with three keynote speakers who are experts in their fields by Nurdiana Darus, Head of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability, Unilever Indonesia, Dr. Insinyur Haruki Agustina M. F. Engs, SC, Director for Contamination Recovery and Emergency Response of Hazardous Waste, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and Dr. Yuki M. A. Wardana, School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia, and Indonesia Infrastructure Guarantee Fund IIGF, PT Penjaminan Infrastruktur Indonesia Persero. Thank you and see you again at 1 p.m. in Indonesian time, GMT plus seven. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvid, Dr. Ian.